In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Last week we talked about uh, Ezra chapter 3. And we were talking about how they began to build the temple and how they built it with how they built it according to the specifications of the law of Moses and how Ezra was trying to make an equivalency between uh, the building of the temple in the time of Solomon and the, the plans of the temple in the time of Moses through the rebuilding of the temple here uh, post-exile. In chapter 4, we start to see um, opposition to the building of the temple. So we see opposition to the building of the temple. And we see how the enemies of the people of Israel actually were initially successful in slowing down the work of building the temple. Actually, chapter 4 is really hard to follow uh, if I don't understand how it's written and, and why it's written that the way it is. The first five verses, we'll see as we read the, the chapter, the first five, five verses are talking about what happened when they began to rebuild. Ezra says that the inhabitants of the land offered to help the Israelites and then they refused. And we'll talk about their little, a, a little bit more about their refusal uh, specifically. Then all of a sudden in verse 6, we flash forward to the reign of Ahasuerus and then Artaxerxes, two other Persian kings. So the events of verses 1 through 5 are happening between like 538 and 520 BC. And the reign of Artaxerxes is, begins at 465 BC, about 50 years later. And that's verses 6 through 23. And then verse 24 goes back into the present time where verses 1 through 5 started. Okay, so we'll talk about why Ezra wrote it that way. Um, but it's important to understand that as you read it or, the, or else it can be confusing. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Er Shaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build the house of our God. But we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So like I said, Ezra, the author of the book, is sort of doing a flash forward. He's about to do a flash forward show that the, that the events that Ezra is discussing in the present time, the fact that there are the inhabitants that are trying to stop them from building the temple, is something that was not only a present problem, but is an ongoing problem, was a problem the entire time that they were building or rebuilding the temple and the altar and the city. Opposition didn't only happen when they first resettled in the area, but as a factor in their lives for the hundred years or so, that the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah are covering. Remember, if we remember from the introduction, we talked about Ezra and Nehemiah are essentially basically one book. They're, they're written kind of together. I want to talk a little bit about what this first couple of verses talks about, the nature of doing spiritual work with God and how we can apply that to my life, how I can apply that in my uh, maybe time in service especially or in any spiritual work, even individual spiritual work. We see it actually time and time again in Scripture, but even though we see it all the time in Scripture, we tend to forget. We think to ourselves, if I'm doing God's work, therefore God must be blessing me, and I should have like an easy path without any opposition. But the truth is, whenever God initiates a spiritual work, it follows almost instantaneously that there will be resistance. The resistance might look different in each circumstance, but almost certainly there will always be resistance. For example, I decide during uh, the great fast, I'm going to take it seriously, and, and this, just is, um, this is the time I'm not going to cheat, I'm going to take the fast very seriously, and this just happens to be the same year that my office decides to have like weekly barbecues, you know? Or I come to Abuna to start a new service and three weeks in, the servants aren't happy and the people are upset 
the service isn't what I expected and their service isn't at the level of what they're expecting or I try to do somebody a favor out of the goodness of my heart and I am punished for it that's the nature of spiritual work there's always going to be difficulty there's always going to be opposition when doing good we shouldn't lose heart we shouldn't quit we shouldn't become discouraged Satan he is the enemy of good so of course he's going to rise up and act when he sees movement towards God we should expect that we should be prepared for that something to uh, like pay attention to in this point in verse 6 it says they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem it says in the reign of Ahasuerus in the beginning of his reign they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem what is one of the titles of Satan in, uh, in the Bible is the accuser. Actually, the word Satan comes from the, the Hebrew word for accusing. So we can be sure that the opposition that they are facing and the opposition that we face when we uh, start a service or even personally start to make movement towards God is not just coming from individuals or groups or my enemies or the people who don't like me or society but from Satan himself my anger or my hatred needs to be directed towards Satan towards sin not towards any person so we look at how did they try to discourage the work the enemies of the exiles tried a number of things to stop them from doing the work the first thing they did was to attempt to destroy them by assimilation in verse 2 he says let us build with you for we seek your God as you do and we sacrifice to him since the days of Ershadon king of Assyria who brought us here and at first glance actually this seems a little bit odd the people of the land are saying hey let us help you we can help we've lived here we worship the same God as you and the same altar that you're trying to rebuild they're trying to show the Israelites how they are similar they say they were brought from their lands because of exile by the Assyrians and actually just to show how accurate and continuous the Bible is we see this recorded this is recorded in 2nd Kings in 2nd Kings 17 it says then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon Kutha Ava Hamath and Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel and they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities and actually you can see even more it says then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord so the king of Assyria sent people to the area not only did he do that he sent them a priest and the priest taught them kind of how to worship God but then it says also in 2nd Kings however every nation continued to make gods of its own and put them in the shrines on the high places which the Samaritans had made every nation in the cities where they dwelt so the people were kind of linked to the Israelites and that they were in the same land and they brought a priest to teach them how to worship God but they mixed their worship with the worship of other gods they claimed to Zerubbabel that they also were worshiping the Lord and that they can help but actually their commitment to worshiping God was like shallow at best and the people returning from exile refused their help they didn't fall for the fact that their true worship their true worship according to the law of Moses was going to be diluted with the worship of idols and to confuse them so even though it would have been nice to have the extra help they refused to accept it because they didn't want to do anything that would later compromise their goal of restarting the true worship of God in his temple this attitude of exclusiveness that was displayed by the Jewish people saying you have no part with us because you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God actually for modern readers that's maybe sometimes troublesome because in, in modern society the highest virtue is to accept and cooperate with people whose beliefs and, and practices differ from our own and if we're tempted to think that maybe Zerubbabel and the other leaders were mistaken why did they do that why wouldn't they let the people who wanted to help help they're trying to do something good 
you have to first understand that the outsiders were considered or identified as enemies. It says, now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, so they were enemies. Although they were pretending to be friends, they were enemies. Their motives were like hidden. Outwardly, yeah, we want to help you. Inwardly, we're going to help you to the point where you and us, we're going to be the same. There is going to be no differentiation. Their neighbors claimed to worship the same God as the Jewish people. But even though they acknowledged him by name, they are worshiping completely a different God. And actually, as I mentioned from the reading in 2 Kings, that mixed population, it says, it worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. And also the, the author of uh, Kings says, to this day they persist in their former practices, they neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and ordinances. So in God's sight, it's not real worship. In God's sight, this is sin, this is rebellion. And actually it would have been fatal for the spiritual life of the community. They didn't have the same convictions. They didn't submit to the authority of God's word. They were not dedicated to the one true God. And we can see clearly that actually their claim that we worship the same God as you is false. And actually, why is that important for us in modern times? Many times people come to us in the guise of saying, I, I, we're like you. We believe in Christ like you do. We follow him like you do. We believe he's the son of God like you do. If one set of religious convictions are true, an opposing set have to be false. But the clear logic of that simple proposition is, is sort of obscured by some modern thinking. And the danger of uh, you know, getting along just to get along is always present. We can be thankful that God used the Jewish decision to maintain the integrity of the Jewish community and continue his plan of redemption so that they could build the temple. Because through this community, the temple was built, worship was restored until our Lord Jesus Christ could come worship at that same temple and establish the church. And actually, we can see later on from the verses that continue that it was a good decision by the people not to... Let them help. We will see that. When the first attempt didn't work, the first attempt was, let's try to build with you. And they were like, no, we're not going to let you build. We're not going to help you. What was their second attempt? Their second attempt was in verse 5. Verse 4 and 5. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Essentially, they tried to pretend they had advice and interest in their project, but their goal was to convince the people returning from exile to deviate from their plan and to deviate from following the will of God to rebuild the temple. Actually, this is a very important point. The tactics of the devil are always deceptive. He doesn't just come right out and tempt us with something blatantly obvious and, and wrong at the time. Because if he did it, we wouldn't fall for that. Many times he tells us little tiny baby steps that get us slowly straying away from the path of God. What's the big deal if you miss a Sunday at church? I'm not saying never go. I'm just saying you had a long day yesterday and you deserve a break. It's going to start again next week. Or what's the, deal, what's the big deal if I attend this party or this gathering? I don't go very often. I know I'm not going to partake of any of the things that they're doing. It's important for me to be hyper vigilant against sin, to avoid even the appearance of evil. I shouldn't be a risk taker when it comes to my salvation. The inhabitants of the land wanted the people f that was returning from exile to be exactly like them. But they weren't, those people were not aligned with God. If the exiles, you know, assimilated, it would have been destruction for them. And actually, St. Paul warns us as Christians to avoid conformity to the world's standards of living and thinking as well. He says very famously in Romans, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed through the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
What's the purpose of my mind, having my mind transformed? If I don't, I won't be able to know the will of God. I'll be doing something different than God's will. And we'll see in the next couple of verses why they were right to avoid the help of others. In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes also, Bishlam, Mithridath, Pavel, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated later into the and translated into the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. From Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Dinites, the Apershatharites, the Tapalites, people of Persia, and Erech, and Babylon, and Shushan, and the Havites, and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the, Jordan, beyond the Jordan and so forth. This is a copy of the letter that they sent to him. To King Artaxerxes from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river and so forth. Let it be known to you, the king, that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if the city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we received support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if the city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. So their letter looks a lot different than what they were saying before. And then the king answers the letter. He says, the king sent an answer to Rahum the commander, to Shimshai the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace, and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. So there have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river, and tax, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease, that the city may not be built until the command is given by me, Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why would damage increase to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of, the, of, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Nahum, Shimsha, Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. So remember, as I was saying, the first couple of verses are written in the present time that, that Ezra was writing about when they were coming back. The verses 5 through 23 were written, almost, like, written about a time almost 70 years later. Why does he do that, first of all? Why does Ezra do that? Why does he jump back and forth? He's not trying to give a chronological order of events. He's trying to establish a theme. Verse 16 actually shows his awareness of his doing this. He says, We inform you that the king of this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed. The result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. Actually, they were still not even building the walls of the city. That doesn't happen until Nehemiah, a few years later. So this is done by Ezra on purpose to make a point. He's, he's giving us, he's like, without like this like, preview of history to reveal the, like, the seriousness of the opposition, we wouldn't appreciate the achievements recorded in the next two chapters, in 5 and 6. Or the dangers hidden in like the rest of the book of Ezra is going to talk about the dangers of mixed marriages, of the Jewish people marrying, marrying to the, the, the Gentiles in, in chapter 7 through 10. And we wouldn't understand how dangerous this was and wouldn't understand the achievements that were achieved in, in chapters 5 and 6 if we did not see the full history of opposition to the building. So Ezra is using the information from the, the, the documents that he has at his disposal to show the persistence of the opposition even after the temple was finished. Actually, the theme of opposition to God's people is obviously prominent throughout the Bible. Pharaoh, 
in the Exodus. Also, like uh, the, 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 another king, Pharaoh, when he was uh, talking about victory over Israel, when the Israelites were destroyed, and it said that they were never to rise again, the Philistines, many people throughout the history were trying to destroy the people of God. Both the Jews as God's chosen people and Christians as the people of God in the New Covenant. And our Lord Jesus Christ was persecuted, and many of his followers persecuted, put to death. In fact, actually, St. Paul says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. He says that in 2 Timothy. Even in our supposed modern and enlightened world, there are many thousands of Christian martyrs each year. Ezra is reminding us we live in a fallen world and we participate in a struggle that there are enemies who try to hinder God's plan. Whenever, like I mentioned before, whenever God is initiating a spiritual work, there's going to be opposition. But God is in control of everything. He is Pantocrator. He is faithful. And his enemies are not going to prevail. Even a small, seemingly defensive, defenseless community like the Israelites here coming back from exile can count on his guidance, on his protection, on his power. So by God's grace, Zerubbabel and the people of Israel refused to fall for the first two attempts to stop the progress. They didn't care about being, or they didn't fall for the trick of, hey, let us help you build the temple. They didn't fall for the trick of we're going to discourage you and we're going to make put counselors to give you bad advice to make it not work. So then they decide, okay, we're gonna we're not we're gonna try something different. We're going to appeal to the king. They wrote a letter. And I want you to pay close attention to think about the letter. Remember what was the approach before? What was the first approach? We're the same. We worship the same God. Let's help you build. Now look at the letter. The letter is stressing something entirely different. It says, let it be known to you, the Jews who came up from you are rebelling. They're a rebellious and evil city. Essentially, if you let them build, these, build this city, if you let them build their temple, if you let them build the walls around the city, they're not going to pay you tax. They're not going to pay you tribute. They're not going to pay you custom. They're going to rebel against you. They used to be a big, great nation. And they're, and they're like, look what they say in verse 14. Now because we receive support from the palace, it's not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. They're saying, we, your loyal subjects, don't want anything bad to happen to you and your country. But these people, these rebellious people, you have to watch out for them. And actually from the perspective of the king, he has a huge empire. He hears there's a small part of the empire that is historically rebellious. And is trying to rise up. The last thing he wants is trouble from some like small rural area. He has a lot of other concerns. And so he replies, essentially falling for everything that's said in the letter. But it's important to see how, you know, Zerubbabel and Joshua were right not to include those people in the rebuilding of the temple. They were not worshipping the same God as them. They did not have the same goals as them. They were working against them. And when they didn't get them what they wanted, they overtly worked against them. But the king, he, he, he un heard this and he, he believed it. He was troubled by the idea that he might lose money. And the fact that the kingdom of Israel used to be a large kingdom. Maybe he, he said, he told them, go look in your record books. And in the time of King David, in the king, time of King Solomon, Solomon used to receive tribute. And so maybe they have a potential to rebel again. So he looked through the archives of their history and he sees that they're a rebellious nation. In, in his response to the letter, the king, he says, yeah, I searched the archives. And actually, you're right. The accusation is justified. The city in the past, they have a reputation of being rebellious. They had a reputation to revolt against foreign kings, people who tried to impose taxes in the area. And so then for that reason, he says, now give the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Actually, this leaves open the possibility that the policy could be reviewed at a later date. He's like, I want them to stop until there is a different command given by me. And actually, by the way, that possibility, that's what Nehemiah uses about 13 years later when he secured permission from the same king to return and build the walls. So he, the king said, make them stop until I say differently. So now it actually gives a lot of uh, context to Nehemiah. 
how much bravery Nehemiah had to have. He knows this is the king who told them to stop. And I'm gonna, that's why he prayed so hard to God before he did any step. He was nervous. What is the king going to do? And then the king concluded the letter with a warning that his representatives in the region shouldn't be negligent in uh, fulfilling this command. And actually they weren't. They went right away and they made them stop. And actually they made them stop even by force. Rehum the commander and Shimshai the scribe, they didn't waste any time implementing the decree. So them and their supporters, they went to Jerusalem, they stopped the rebuilding of the temple, probably by force. And actually they went probably beyond the, the terms of the decree because it says in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3 that they demolished and burned what had already been constructed. So not only did they stop them from building, but they actually uh, demolished what had already built. Then it says in verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem ceased and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. It seems sort of incredible that the same returned exiles, the ones in chapter 3, if you remember from the week before, they were shouting with great joy. They praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was being built. And then they discontinued the, the work. Actually, it says until the second year of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia, that's 15 years. They stopped working for 15 years. How could fear stop the, the zeal that the, that the people have? We already saw, like, maybe there was a little bit of lack of fervor because only some of the heads of families came to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem and they made free will offerings. Actually, the experience of the exiles conforms to all of the covenant renewals in Israel. This is a, a great example and analogy and metaphor for all the times that uh, Israel tried to return to God and even sometimes the times that we try to return to God. Due to the sinfulness and the weakness of human, the human partner in the covenant, the covenant always was ruined by mankind. Until our Lord Jesus Christ or I fulfilled the prophecy by Jeremiah that I will put within them, I will write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We find that pattern of weakness already, for example, in Abraham. All the way back in Abraham, even though he received the covenant promise that he would have a son by his wife, he jeopardized everything by pretending to be lying to King Abimelech. And when God took too long for Abraham to have a child, he went to Sarah's handmaid, had Ishmael or even when Moses led the people out of Egypt to give them a law and the Lord was speaking to, to Moses face to face like he spoke to a friend that's what it says in Exodus but the people couldn't enter the promised land because they didn't they were afraid and they only looked and even Moses himself wasn't able to look he was only able to look excuse me almost immediately after for example God proclaimed his covenant with David and said I am going to have you and your descendants be on this throne forever. What does he do? He goes and finds Bathsheba and kills her husband Uriah. And so then the temple had to wait until Solomon's time. So in this context, the, returned ex the, ret the people who are returning from exile, their failure to continue to act on their initial impulse to build the temple shows that just like the Israelites who went before them, they are, they are waiting for the Messiah to change them, to change their hearts so that they can fulfill the covenant promise, they can fulfill their end of the promise so that they can be holy and they can, they can dwell in intimacy with God. They're not yet where they should be. So you see here that like the pattern, God makes a, prom makes a covenant with them, with the people of Israel, and they immediately fall short. He makes a covenant and they fall short. He makes a covenant and they fall short until the Messiah comes and he fulfills and makes a new covenant with God and man, like reuniting God and man, and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.